The clock is actually. Can we fix that? Can we fix that? Sir, can we fix that? How many how many PGC you need to fix the clock? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there's one. There's two. You can do some gymnastics. I don't care. 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 I this is <laughs> the most that's like German. Okay. The, only, the only opportunity we take like that would be the exam. So we have two places here. Maybe people can a little bit shrink into the middle. Yeah. The pandemic is over, so you can really slip shrink to the middle. That would be great. We have some premium seats here, first row, second row, if people string a little bit. I guess there's there's two more here, third row. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, we're complete. We're sold out. That's great. Welcome to Deep Learning for NLP. 2023 edition. My name is Ivan Habernal and this is Martin Tutek. I'll introduce ourselves later on again. Come in. Yes, come in. There's still free seats. So well, you have to be creative, but you'll find. Uh, this, is not the this is not the biggest room at the university. And this is not definitely the best room for actually seeing something on the screen, you know, just from the middle. I'm sorry about it. I complained and they said, uh, I don't know, something like, uh, yeah, we're out, we're short of uh, lecture rooms or whatever. So there is only one cool thing about this this lecture hall is it has air condition. So in summer, we love it. I can guarantee you, okay? But that's the only advantage of this room, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's get started. Can you see something at least on the slides? If you, if you can see anything on the slides, take your note, uh, iPad, whatever you have, and you can download the slides and just you know, have a local copy so you can read locally. I'll show you where to get it. So, okay, let's start with some, some motivation why we're here. So deep learning for NLP. Um, let me ask a question. So who has studied something with 
NLP, natural language processing. Raise your hand, natural language processing. Okay, cool. Thanks. Deep learning. Wow. Okay, cool. Why are you here? Uh, okay, wait. Um, yeah, that's it. Machine learning. It's deep learning. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So why why are we here? What is the 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 what's your motivation to be here if you studied already? So those people who study deep learning and NLP, why are you here? Very okay. Is there something like specific deep learning for NLP? Well, I hope so. I hope so, but times are changing. Any other any other motivation to be here? Because I listen to podcast with uh, Richard Doha. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, I want to know more. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so you're you listen to podcast with Richard Socher. Okay, Richard Richard Socher Socher. He's German. Okay, cool. So. So the motivation why to be here, there's so many things, but this is it. No. GPT-4, is there anybody in the, in the room who hasn't used ChatGPT or GPT-4 or ChatGPT? Anyone haven't heard of ChatGPT? So I don't think we need more motivation for this course, right? We need to understand the thing. We need to learn it. After this course, you should be able to build it, but not to train it. Unless you work for you know big companies like Google, Meta, or the UKT lab or my lab or no well we're we don't have so many resources but you know the goal is to learn more about this and understand it as much as possible so we stitched together a little bit of roadmap uh, and this is something which will update a little bit but here you have a little bit of overview of what's coming up to you so you can look it up later on and you know we're trying to pack as much as possible and we'll have uh, two guest lectures at the end, and we'll have some buffer as well. So, but this is something which roughly will be, you know, will be around. Okay. So, first logistics, what we're gonna do. So we're two lecturers, and I'm the first one. I'm Ivan. Nice to meet you. I'm leading the Trust LCLT group, which I'll introduce later on. And it's my pleasure to introduce you also, Martin Tutek. Say hi. Well, not, okay. <laughs> And we're he, uh, Martin is a postdoc at the UKP lab from uh, from Irina Gurevich, and we're jointly basically running this course with a couple of other people, uh, the tutors. So Martin, Minwu, Doanam, Yanran, and Hatis, um, who will be helping us with the uh, the exercises and homeworks. I'll get to that. So and we'll be splitting the lectures. Basically, I'll take the first six lectures. Then Martin will take over and you know take the rest, like uh, seven until twelve, and then we'll have this guest lecture. This is the plan, roughly. Great. Any questions so far? Not a case. If you want to sit down, we have really a couple of places somewhere, but you, you just have to be creative and somehow push the people a little bit. Sorry. Yeah. So let's move on. Okay. So. This is a this is a live course. Excuse me. So we're doing live lectures, uh, but also we have a couple of online resources to make it more kind of bringing to the twenty first uh, century. So obviously we have Moodle. You know, the <laughs> the user interface from two thousand seven is still here, so it's uh, I think it's cool again, like the nineties. So we have Moodle. It's horrible, but it's official and it works. So all the so go there and sign up for Moodle because all the announcements will be done there. There's discussion forum, so you can ask questions there as well. We'll use Moodle mostly for the exercises and the homeworks. The lectures are, this is the next point, lectures are on GitHub. So all these PDFs are open source on GitHub, so you can download the PDF, the LaTeX code if you want. You can just use it whatever you, reasons you want. This is... Creative Commons by uh, license. And we also bring it to the, you know, 2023. So I set up the Discord channel. So sign up to the Discord. I mean, all these links are in the slides as well. So you can download the slides and have the links. Go to Discord, which brings the user, inter user experience really to 2023. And we'll use it for basically, I don't know, like addressing your questions, maybe some announcements. It's more unofficial, but don't be nasty, okay? So it's like your typical Discord channel. I don't know what you do on Discord, but you can use nicknames. <laughs> I don't mind, but just behave, you know, behave wisely. Uh, you can reach us on one of those things, but typically not on Discord on the weekend. So if you, you know, if you ping me on Discord the day before the exam, it's gonna be Sunday, I'm sorry. 
Also, we're going to, I mean, the plan is that we record the lectures and put them on YouTube, right? So I'll post it uh, somewhere to Moodle then, the link to the YouTube, uh, YouTube lectures. And the thing is, um, you know, it's better to participate here because you can make it more interactive. At least if you have questions, you can ask here. And also on YouTube, I mean, I, I'm using microphone here, so you will hear me, but you won't hear the questions from the audience or the discussion from the audience, which is kind of mm, yeah, not a great experience. So the idea is to put it on YouTube, you know, for your reference, if you want to you know, watch it later, maybe just to you know, refresh a couple of things. So, and because we're on YouTube, you know, subscribe, like. <laughs> no, I mean, it makes me happy. You know, if I see a like, you know, if I post something on Moodle, it's like, uh, yeah. If I post it on Discord and I see like a like, you know, my brain starts, uh, you know, I get, um, uh, how's it called, uh, endorphins, you know, release, and I, I'm, I'm, it makes me happy, you know, because it's social media and it works. Anyway, so YouTube channels, it's the same thing, you know. Anyway, but I'm doing, <laughs> we're not doing it for, uh, for the sake of getting likes on YouTube. So resources, we'll, okay, there's no textbook for the whole course. There's two reasons for that. Deep learning for NLP or deep learning, the field is evolving so rapidly that you know if you write a textbook two years later, you can use half of it. Second, we're using freely available resources mostly. So everything we use, you can get for free legally. And, and basically the top-notch research in natural language processing is also open source. So basically the community of research in, ACE, in, um, in NLP is kind of centered around the Association for Competition Linguistics, shortly ACL, and they run a couple of conferences and the ACL conference, Knuckle and so on. So you'll, you'll see citations to those conferences and uh, all the papers are kind of freely available there in the, in the anthology or archive. So we're gonna use basically public resources. If there's something which you need to read, I'll let you know. Most of the, you know, the links, the references are just that you can really go to the sources and get more material if you're interested in the topic. Any questions? Good. Exercises and homeworks. So we have exercises, which is something that you do on your own and you should deepen your understanding of the matter. And this is not great. This is something for you to, you know, take it from a different, little bit different angle and try something hands on, which is related to the topics we're discussing. Uh, if you want to use ChatGPT for exercises, do it. I'm, I'm fine. Will you learn something from using ChatGPT for exercises? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know, but it's it's a you know it's a nice experience. I mean, use whatever tools you want. If you want to cheat the, the whole course, you can do it easily. You know that's fine. Maybe except for the exam. I'm not sure. I haven't seen so many people cheating on the exam because I use the same exam. Can I say it? <laughs> I used the same exam over maybe two years, maybe, and and the distribution of errors was mostly the same. So, so that's fine, you know. But don't cheat. I mean, it's up to you. I don't. You have to know why you're here. Then we have homeworks. Yeah, this is maybe more. I know this is maybe a bigger bigger issue for homeworks. So it's basically some programming exercises where you really, really, really get your hands dirty and you'll be doing some something, some programming. It, it's a bigger class, so we we have groups of two. You know, so you have to pair up with somebody will will post the logistic exactly on, on Moodle. And this is graded. And if you if you achieve over roughly 70% of the of the points, you will get a bonus for the exam. It's not much. So basically it's for you to get them, you know, dirty hands and try something, code something, and the bonus is just a bonus. I would recommend to do it anyway because you learn something. You can use, if you want to use ChatGPT for that, I'm fine, but maybe you won't learn that much. So if, if you do it only for the bonus points, then I would say like, let it go. So this is not set up yet. How exactly, how many exercises and so on, exercises and homeworks, because we're just, we're just starting and we have the team ready with tutors. We're meeting this week to set it up. So there will be an exercise, I guess, next week, the first one, and then the homeworks will follow. Okay. Any questions? Yes. So the exercises will be roughly weekly. Homeworks will be overall, I guess, four or five homeworks in total. So not a weekly basis. Some will be bigger programming things, some shorter. 
Any other question? Yes. No, it's on do it on your own. So it's just single. These are mostly like theoretical, or you just read something and make up, you know, trying to address an issue instead of just really programming a big project. Okay. Anything else? Good. Final exam. Save the date. It's Monday, July 31, so 31st, uh, at Lichtwiese. If you've never been to Lichtwiese, it's not really nice. The Menza is as good as here. But they have this huge lecture hall. So there are four rooms, but it's one. And it fits, I guess, you know, a thousand people or so. So we'll be there. Yeah, come in. And and it's just a standard exam. So you register via Tukan and uh, yeah, okay, the language. So you might have noticed this course will be held in English, at least from me, from Martin as well, from the guest lectures from Timur as well. And maybe Thomas will do it in, in German, but I don't think so. I think everything will be in English, okay? So the final exam, the questions will be in English as well. And you can answer uh, in any meaningful language you want. So English or German or something else, which we do on other side. I mean, Czech, Croatian, uh, and Timur speaks five languages. So you can choose your language, okay? But we don't speak Chinese, I'm sorry. So the, you know, how big the exam? So the exam, basically, I think it took like a, an hour. Was it an hour? It takes an hour and it should be fun. I mean, people kind of get, you know, if you ask people from previous years, they will say, yeah, it was kind of fun, but hard. So don't ask. Yeah, I mean, it can't be easy, right? I mean, it makes no point. But it should be, it should make sense. And uh, we try to, we tried hard to make it somehow realistic. One thing is that I don't have exam because we reused the exams from last year. Don't ask me for exams, you know, from last year. I'm not sharing them because it takes a painful lot of time to create a new exam. So maybe we'll reuse a part of that. So if you ask me, oh, what is its clausul relevant from this lecture? I say, I don't know. And that's true because I don't know because we'll do the exam in June and then we'll see how much we covered and what's kind of makes sense to ask you or which what we are kind of expecting, you know, that you should understand. But the same thing we were saying in the lectures, like what, you know, what are you learning and why? Why is it important? Okay. Any question to the exam? Good. So it will be standard paper writing exam. You don't need any anything, no calculator, nothing. Okay. So this is not online. It will take some time to to grade the exams, like a couple of weeks in summer, because you're a you know larger crowd. Obviously, this is not only my course or my, mine and Martin's, so it should be more interactive. And your your feedback matters actually. So you know, whatever you, you like or dislike, tell us. Put it on Discord, write it in the forum, send us an email. Any questions you might have, yeah, come in. Any questions you might have, you can just, uh, you can approach us easily. Um, the email addresses are there as well. So if you wanna send us email, that's fine. What, I'm, what we're trying to do is to post some anonymous feedback forms just to get feedback, you know, because it's important. Like, uh, you never know whether you covered everything well or not. So you're trying to make it really more open source, you know, which means build it yourself. So your feedback matters. And um, and we'll we'll take it into account. account. And the same for slides. So if there's issues, typos, whatever in the slides, it's LaTeX. So who, okay, who doesn't know LaTeX here? It's just, I'm curious, who doesn't know LaTeX? Fine, okay, cool. So the majority. Right, so if you see something wrong in the slides, who doesn't have a GitHub account? <clears throat> GitHub account, everybody has one? Okay, that's brilliant, okay, cool. So whatever you see is wrong here, just open open a, a issue on GitHub, any feedback issue on GitHub, pull, re pull request, whatever, that would be really awesome. All right, and I think we're through mostly. I'll shortly introduce my research group. Martin, if you wanna leave and you feel free because you have a pretty tight deadline. So thanks a lot. Say hi to Martin, see you in five lectures. <laughs> okay, so 
little bit of introduction, who are we? And um, Martin will introduce himself once he starts his lectures later on. And uh, I'm gonna introduce a little bit of my group. It's called Trustworthy Human Language Technologies. What does it mean? It means many things, but ma mainly we are dealing with privacy. So we're looking into privacy preserving natural language processing. What does it mean to protect privacy of you? If you're part of the data somewhere and we're training with your data, can we protect your privacy? If it's uh, natural language text. So it's also a little bit tricky. What we're using is uh, differential privacy. And with deep, you know, deep learning is definitely the tool of the day, graph networks and so on. So this is our research. If you're interested in what we're doing, just go to the website and look at the papers. We have maybe some talks as well. And the second part is uh, argument mining that matters. So what does it mean? Well, if you if you argue, if you argue on the internet, mostly it doesn't matter. But if you argue in front in, in front of the court on the case, maybe it matters more. So we're looking into arguments uh, at the court. So how people argue in front of the uh, European Court for Human Rights, for instance. And we're trying to analyze the arguments, the patterns from the like legal perspective as well. So this is more inter interdisciplinary research, legal NLP, legal argument mining, which means also if you're interested in doing master thesis or if you're interested in doing a, a heavy job or like a student research assistant, just get in touch. We have a couple of postings. We're desperately always looking for people who are motivated to learn something and do something for research. Talk to us. We have a couple of postings. Check out the website. We're just looking now for at least three, three persons now who can do some some coding or people who actually speak more languages. Because we're doing for for the ECHR project, we need people speaking French, I guess, or maybe other languages. And uh, we're doing some data data analysis there. So get in touch. Any questions? Yes. That's a great question. Whether we are part of UKP or not. So yes and no, officially not. So this is like independent research group and I'm independent research group leader. So I'm sort of independent by definition, but we are cooperating closely with, uh, with UKP, which means we're sitting, we're sharing some offices, we're, we're sharing hardware, and we're closely collaborating on research projects as well. But I'm, I'm independent of UKP, but we are really on good terms. So Martin is basically postdoc at UKP. I used to be a postdoc at UKP before and so on. So, but we're independent. Any other question? Anyone wants to get a job? Uh, no, not really. Oh, come on. Okay, why? Well, later, I, I'll convince you, okay? Good. Um, let's move on. Let's move on to the actual content. So let me just take it down. So the actual content of this, of this lecture is not about the history of deep learning because everybody knows it from you. It's not about um, the perceptron, which everybody starts with like, oh, how can I build a perceptron? And you know, it's not about that. And we're, we're taking a twist a little bit here and we're starting from, from the end. We're starting from some you know NLP tasks and their evaluation. And why is that so? So why why should we learn this? Why should we why should we do this? I mean it's important to ask like why should I learn something about NLP task? I want to build you know tools, I want to build GPT fours and this is cool. So I don't care about the tasks. Well my my perspective on that is that uh, deep learning is just a tool as any other tool. And we need to understand why we need this tool in the first place. Why do, why do we need it? What are we going to solve it? And how do we know this is the right tool for our task? Like, is it a good hammer? But if you're not, if you're not you know, hammering nails, then why, why hammer, right? So we need to understand what, what the task are we solving and, and whether we're good at it or not, objectively. So we're kind of starting to set up the scene. Why do why we need this? And we'll start with um, with uh, sort of like typology of the tasks. So what is a task? What is and why are people talking about tasks and benchmarks? What does it mean? So basically, basically, very, very kind of uh, coarse typology. 
working with text is that either you do text classification or you do text generation. Roughly, 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 roughly. Okay, there's more flavors to that and we'll see at the end, maybe you can cast everything as one task, but roughly and historically, you can classify text or you can create text, generate text. So let's start with the classification a little bit. And I'm gonna go through, let's say some typical tasks and their data sets. So then once you see them later on, like doing, I don't know, doing master thesis, going to the industry somewhere and seeing, oh yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is this task, it rings a bell. So you know it exists and it's well established in research and the praxis. This is the goal, you know, what's there? Which tasks are typical? You know, why, what people are trying to solve? So let's start with uh, something which is super, super, super simple to solve, at least theoretically. And it's the sentiment classification of movie reviews. Okay, so those of you who did NLP and maybe some deep learning, who of you did something with sentiment analysis of reviews or movies? Okay, not many, okay, great. So what did you do? You used exactly this data set. Okay, cool. So what did you build? Ensemble learning, okay, wow, well, that's that's wild. Okay, good, yeah, random first. Uh, was it deep learning? Um, um, I didn't use any like uh, um, complex uh, words in between or anything, yeah. it just was back and forth. Okay. And yeah, that was it. Okay, cool, anyone else who did it? Uh, you raise your hand. So what did you, what did you do? Classification model for tweets. So what did you do with tweets? Like sentiment for tweets? Okay, great. So my question is like, why did you do it? Why why tweets? Why classification of tweets? It was fault. Yeah, it was fault. Okay, good, yes, okay. Somebody told you to do it, so you did it, right? Okay, so you didn't ask like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a fair reason, right? So you didn't ask like, why the heck should I like, what is sentiment on this Twitter? You know, I don't care. Yes, you have a point. Oh, for tickets, okay. I would I would do it the other way. I mean, I would really put you know the anger one put on hold and you know just relax and I'll get to you. Okay, okay. Happy customers. Okay, that's that makes sense. So, exactly. So sentiment. So let's let's thank you for your input. So sentiment classification of movie reviews. Basically, it's a binary classification mostly of reviews from IMDb. I'm talking about this particular paper from Andrew Maas and others from ACL 2011. This is the IMDb dataset, right? It's the IMDb dataset which you download somewhere. And it's uh, here's an example. I look into that, and it's like I think the shortest review there. Read the book, forget the movie, <laughs> which is negative, obviously, against the movie. And basically, you have negative and positive uh, labels there. What you need to understand, what you need to understand to classify the review of a movie into positive or negative sentiments, so like bad movie or good movie, is a semantic compositionality. So how words work together in their meaning, and also if the movies are long, the, the reviews are long, how one part from the beginning is related to the to the rest because you have long dependencies in the text. You need to un maybe you need to understand maybe not. It's just maybe a few words like ugly and so on. But here there's no there's no such a word. Read a book, forget a movie. So you need to understand uh, what is what it means. Uh, it's not easy. Like there's no word signaling like this is a negative thing. You need to understand the contrast between movie and book. What what does it mean? Like forget forget the movie. What does it mean and so on. So anyone did um, digit recognition or MNIST? Who does, who does know MNIST? What is what MNIST is? Okay, what is MNIST? Default or most basic image data set of 10 classes. Exactly, exactly. So for computer vision people, MNIST is just a bunch of digits and you classify the, the, the image of the digit into the actual digit. 
And everything you try in deep learning for computer vision, you have to try on, on MNIST. It's like the litmus paper. So IMDB is sort of for NLP, the, the MNIST. You should try it on IMDB to see whether it works. You have a new model. If you don't try on IMDB and claim this is really great, then, or it used to be like at least. It's like a standard data set, which you, you know, pull out of box and try something, you know, well, how is my random forest working on IMDB? 81%, 83%, 86? Something like that, 86% accuracy, I would say. Something around, I mean, if it's 50, 50, then you're like, oh, that is bad. So the question is, why is it, why, why is it interesting? Why was it interesting? Why movie, you know, sentiment of movies? Why is it interesting? Why people start using movie reviews for predicting the sentiment of, uh, of the text? Why movie reviews? Probably because there's a bunch of data, which is already labeled. <laughs> nice, yes. Very opportunistically, there's a bunch of data somewhere which is labeled. How, but how labeled? What does it, well, what does it mean? Probably, I, I don't know how any way you can work, but probably like one to five stars. <laughs> exactly. Somebody wrote a review and say like it's one star, four stars, five stars. So people say, yeah, okay. So everything which is one star is negative. Everything five stars is positive. You scrape it from the internet and then you have a data set for free. That's one reason. Is any other reason why people, yeah, so this is like very opportunistic. Okay, so it's like, it, it's a variety of language there from different people, that's what you were saying. Yeah, that's a great point. So, one of the pion pioneers of this data set or of this task was Lily and Lee, and they, they had a paper in 2004 on classifying reviews on Twitter. And she gave a talk and she said, the reason why they started with this, with the movie reviews, one of the reasons was, the, was the, the variety of the language. And she said, the beauty of language. Because these reviews, well, not this one, this is really you know, short and kind of really to the point, but most of movie reviews are kind of poetic and nice to read and very kind of you know figurative language, which 20 years back was considered something super hard to understand for machines. So they say like, well, if a machine can kind of understand the sentiment of this long review in this kind of figurative language, this would be an achievement. And it was fun to read them as well. You know, so there's different motivations why people do it. Like, you know, you have to do this for customers. Satisfaction, yeah, that's a clear goal. Somebody is just curious and it's like, yeah, this is a nice language, so we should understand it. And then somebody, you know, and you have data for free. So absolutely, you know, this is the killer, exactly. Okay, any questions? So where do you, where do you get the data? Where do you get it? Yes. You can scrape IMDB, exactly. How do you get the data in 2023? I mean, this is great, this is a great answer, but you can, there's an easier way. Hugging face, exactly. So hugging face is a is a collection of now, what is it, 28,800 uh, something data sets which somebody did the dirty job for you and collect it and put it there in a nice format so you can just you know take it out of box and run your uh, random forest thing and just you know don't care about what's the language, beauty of language and labels and so on, which is great, but you have to understand what's behind, you know, if you're, if you're serious about it. So you go to the Hugging Face data set and you download through API or whatever, so you can get data sets. So, and as I said, like the IMDB data set, well, you have to be really sure if you talk about data set, you cite it, you know, and maybe link what exactly, because you can, IMDB, you can scrape anytime you want and you have different data set, but you have to compare apples to apples. So everybody should use the same data set if they're comparing the systems, right? Okay, any questions to sentiment analysis on movies? So the IMDB data set, the litmus paper, you know, you should somehow remember there's a thing like IMDB data set because everybody's using that. Cool, let's move on. So there's another task, which is called natural language inference. And the standard paper for natural language interest is the SNLI, the Stanford natural language inference task. What does it mean? We have two sentences and these are somehow related to each other. And either they're related as an entitlement or contradiction or they're neutral. And these two sentences are called a text and a hypothesis. And the text is here in this example, a soccer game with multiple males playing. So it's basically, yeah, come in. So it's basically describing a scene, right? There's a soccer game with multiple ma ma males playing. And the hypothesis text is some men are playing sport. 
And the goal is whether when you hear the text, so the text is true, is the hypothesis true as well? So if I tell you a soccer game with multiple males playing, is it true that some men are playing sport? Yes, it's true. If there is a soccer, you know, it's, if males playing soccer somewhere, it's true that some men are playing sport, right? Does that make sense? So this is entitlement. If the second sentence would be a soccer game with multiple males playing, and the sentence would be, uh, yeah, a butterfly is sitting on a <laughs> on a flower, it would be like neutral because there is no relationship. If the second sentence would be some women are playing sport, it would be contradiction because we have multiple males playing, right? So we have three kind of three different labels for two sentences, how they work together. So the standard paper is the SNLI paper, and it's it's almost 600,000 of these sentence pairs. So they took a lot of money, hired some persons like road workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and let them write these kind of things and collected a bunch of almost half a million human written English sentence pairs. So it's really a huge data set. And they do some annual labeling for balanced classification. So it's balanced data set. So, and the difference here between the IMDB before is that, yeah, sorry, it's really below, so you can't see that, but just, you know, open your local slides and just follow. That IMDB was for free, right? You scrape it from the internet, you get the stars and call it a day. Here, you have to pay people to do it. And I think they paid a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of money to create this data set, 600,000 pairs. How, how, how many of these pairs can you write in, a, in an hour? How many how many pairs can you write in an hour? What are you gonna do after writing sixty pairs of that? You're gonna hate it. <laughs> you know you're gonna hate a job because it's terrible. I mean you know it's it's not fun. So that's why you need a, real, a lot of lot of you know large pool of people, and just you know kind of scale up. Half a million sentences is is a lot. Which brings me to one sort of sidestep. And it's the gold standard data. So what does it mean? <laughs> it might have multiple meanings. So many data sets are annotated by experts, you know, and it could be super costly. And in these examples, each example is, uh, is annotated by multiple annotators. So annotator is somebody who is kind of annotating the data saying, well, contradiction, entitlement, or neutral, or positive or negative on the tweet, because tweets don't have any, any labels. And then the final label is, is decided upon. So the final gold, gold label. So the gold could be, could mean, okay, so several people agreed on a label for a particle instance. So this is like the, the gold truth. Or the gold can mean it's costly because you, know, you have to pay a lot of people, these experts. One example here is that we, so I put this reference here. We were annotating, um, legal decisions from the Court of European Human Rights with six law students over a year. So how much how much did it cost? Any estimate? How much we paid for annotating a data set, which is now publicly available in this publication? How much did we pay? Any estimates? 50 to 100,000. 50 to 100,000 would be great. I know <laughs> it's, it's way too much. No, uh, 20K roughly. It's a lot of money, 20,000 euro, Whew. okay, a year of work, you know, so it's costly because you need these experts. We need the, we need the law, lawyers or law students to understand the legal language because I couldn't understand anything, you know, so I couldn't annotate anything. So that's why it's called gold label data. So it's super costly to produce good data. It's easy to get it from, <laughs> from hugging face data sets, right, for free. This is great. So appreciate somebody who did some annotation. Anyone annotated here something? Anybody did like some human annotation study? So oh, what? Okay, great. <laughs> if you have a chance, do it. Do it because then you will understand how terrible that is to annotate data. No, it is. It is. It's 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 boring. You know, the worst thing you can do is annotating something on the on the internet, like social media. So, for example, annotating. Uh, posts on Facebook, whether they're toxic or not. Not only you're going to hate it, but it's going to hurt. It's true. It's just, you know, how much 
stupid it is out there in the world. That really hurts. If somebody, you know, if OpenAI is annotating their data, they're outsourcing it to somebody else, paying low wages. I'm recording on YouTube, I don't care. They're paying low, low wages and let people for low wages annotate toxic comments or even maybe pornography. It's a really bad thing. You know, annotating data could be, you know, could hurt you like sickly. Anyway, um, but if you have a chance annotating something, do it. Just, you know, understand how time consuming and interesting the task is. How do you make sure that you have good quality of data? So basically you compare, if you have like, I don't know, like three people for the same example, you're gonna compare compare them together and make sure that, you know, the chance, the if they agree on the label, it could be by chance. So if you just take an, take an let's say an, um, an average agreement, it will be maybe bigger than the actual agreement is. So there are a couple of measures for inter so-called inter-annotator agreements. And there's few measures like Cohen's Kappa, P, Kripper, and so forth. I don't want you to remember all of them, but I want you to remember that there's there's actual measures for agreement computation among people, among annotators. You know? So if you wanna if you annotate a data set and you ask for quality, they should have done something as internet data agreement. And there's some metrics and they have meaning. So it's important to know how. What does it tell? Well, it tells also like there's a subjectivity in the task. You know? And if this is completely subjective, then maybe it makes no sense to run machines on, the, on that, right? Okay, any questions to gold standard data? Great. Second question is a side step. So who creates these tasks? Why? I mean, so we had this kind of example of uh, movie reviews because it's you know poetic and fun. So mostly researchers. Mostly researchers are interested in doing some tasks. Sometimes companies saying, well, I want to, you know, I want to uh, improve, uh, what was that, uh, customer experience. So if somebody is calling me angry, I need to solve it and I need to prioritize things. Yeah, so it's fine. So there's different stakeholders in the game. But these tasks I'm presenting today, just mostly researchers, because they are interested in some phenomena in language. For example, a sentiment, because it's just an interesting thing to observe in data. And to which extent we can solve them by tools. So basically it's also setting up be benchmarks for, for automatic machines or for machines to kind of tackle with that. You know, are we able to say whether an email is a spam or not? It's solved, right? I mean, it's not interesting anymore. 20 years back, it was kind of like interesting. Yeah, can we, can we decide automatically if it's a spam or not? And also the data sets created and sharing them it's, it was popular with machine learning in NLP. So basically you start creating data sets and they become sort of like standard benchmarks. What is a standard? It defines, it's defined by the community. So the community somehow is interested now in doing IMDB data sets, sentiment analysis, and everybody's using that. Nobody is pushing you to do so, but you kind of feel like this is the, you know, the standard data set. And, and obviously you're sharing data set and comparing them your new system because you have new network and say like, oh, I wanna, I'm better than uh, random forest on IMDb, so 87%. I have like this new kind of cool thing, GPT-5. It's gonna be like 99%, whatever. But you have to do it on the same data set, okay? So these tasks are classified into various arbitrary taxonomies with mostly agreed upon names. So for example, sentiment analysis is sort of a task and it's part of text classification or sentence classification, document classification. The SNLI, the Stanford Natural Language Inference, is a sort of sentence pair classification. You know, but these are arbitrary names, so you can call them differently and it's fine as well. So there is no like set in stone taxonomy of tasks. But people kind of kind of converge into, you know, seeing, ah, yeah, this is a document classification. Okay, any question to this? Right. So let's move on. And now let's say um, we are going deeper into a sentence and we're interested in finding entities or so-called name entities in a, in a sentence. So we, we have a predefined types of entities and we wanna locate them in the sentence. And here's an example. So the, the sentence goes from you know, top to bottom. UN official Echos, Echos, sorry, heads for Baghdad. So, this is some news from 2000, 
two, I guess. And here we have the UN is labeled as organization. Echeus is probably some person and Baghdad is the yeah, definite location is a city. So how to model this task? Because it's not like saying, well, this is binary decision over the whole document. So how can we, how can we model that? And well, this is a question. How would you, how would you model that? How would you label this, this thing? If I want you to find entities in a text like organization, person, location, how to annotate such a task? So only the only thing you see is a sentence, right? And the sentence would be like a plain text, basically. No, no new lines. You have a sentence. So what you need to do first? Oh, one, two, three. Okay, you. <laughs> Okay, so you're you're assuming you you have some somewhere a list of all these organizations and you wanna create a data set out of it. Yeah, maybe I would say you have news and you have nothing else. So maybe it won't work. Any other ideas? So so you sorry. Exactly. We should first tokenize a thing because we're, you know, here you see the tokenization. So splitting into words. So we have to say UN is a word, official is a word, echoes is a word, heads and so on. And the dot is not a word because we are going to label the tokens. Okay. This is one first assumption we need to take into account. And then the second thing, we have the tokens. So what are we going to do? Then it's easy. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, okay. So you're saying you can take only nouns and annotating nouns and ignoring rest. Yeah, I mean, you can do this as well. I would say it's much easier. So you tokenize and then assign each, assign each word or each token, let's be more concrete, a type. So we're going to say the UN was organization, Echos was person, and Baghdad was something else. What we are using here is so-called BIO tagging. It will be on the next slide as well. And we're saying each of these words has a label. So these are the labels, right? And the O label is, it's not zero, it's O. And it means like, maybe it's a zero. No, it's O actually, it's BIO tagging. So yeah. it's like out of entity, so there's nothing. So each word, every word that is not, not the entity is assigned with O. And the, we are assigning these I minus org and I minus per and I minus slog to these tokens, which are the entity. Okay. It looks weird, but I'll show you why. So, yes. Why isn't it B? Yeah, that's a good question. So, why isn't it B? So, what, what, so you're, you know something. So, what is, what is I and what is B then? B is begin. Okay. Exactly. That would be that would that's interesting observation, and I am fully with you. So what we have here that if we had a say a longer a longer entity, which would be I don't know a word entity a person. Okay, Angela Merkel. So if we had a text something something Angela Merkel something something, and you would uh, you would annotate it as a beginning of person and here this would be inside person like uh, that that would be your understanding and i guess it's not wrong and actually this is how i understand as well but i look into the original paper of these you know this uh, annotation and what they did was something else they said if two consequent tokens are of the same type whenever two entities of the type are immediately next to each other. So it wasn't the Angela Merkel, it would be, uh, what could be like two entities of the same type next to each other? Without comma. Austin, Texas. Okay, so Austin, Texas, blah, blah, blah. Austin, Texas. Blah, blah, blah. I would put comma here, actually. 
and it would be O, and the problem would be solved. If there is no comma, then you would, based on this original understanding, original description of BIO tagging, you would say, this is E location, and this is B location, right? And it's kind of not intuitive. How I would annotate it would be, yeah, there's a beginning of location, and here's another beginning of location, right? It kind of makes sense, right? I mean, here we have beginning and inside, and then we be O's maybe and O's, which is clear. Here it's kind of awkward, but this is how I, how they defined, and it, it I I got it wrong for you know for a long period of time. So there is many flavors of these BIO encoding, and there is also others called below, below and. BOA and so on. So just that you know, it, it doesn't matter how you define the task, it has to be unambiguous. So if you have two consecutive entities, you have to make sure that this will be clear. Like what does it mean? What labeling means? Whether this is B log and I log or B log and B log and so on, it's a matter of the actual data set and actual task. But as I said, like, there is a standard data set. So this is the, sorry, coming back, the CO Conal um, 2003. They have four entities, person, organization, location, and mists like miscellaneous. And they use this uh, BIO encoding in the way they describe here. So this is from the paper. Kind of, yeah, their decision, basically. Okay, any question? Yeah. By hand. They, they took the, they, so the data set for this task was taken from the Reuters corpus, which you had to buy back then, the license, you, you bought the Reuters corpus and they let people, maybe their authors or somebody from their department annotated per hand, the entities, <laughs> a lot of money back then, right? So now you can download it for free. Like it's basically public domain, the data set. It's been here for 20 years. Any question to BIO tagging? Okay, that's great. So keep in mind, name the recognition by BIO and its sequence labeling. Let's move on. Superglue. <laughs> okay, so Superglue, it's a popular benchmark, well, three years, four years old now. Uh, collection, it's a collection of benchmarks. It's not just a single task, like uh, name the recognition or SNLI. It's a collection of various tasks in, in English. There's also multilingual superglue, but this one is just in English. And the goal of superglue is to provide a simple, robust evaluation metric of any method capable of being applied to a broad range of language understanding tasks. So glue means general purpose language understanding, G-L-U-A. And super means just they took a glue and make it bigger. <laughs> so it's superglue. Um, but everybody knows that, so you should know as well. Super glue or glue are just a standard task for language understanding. So if you see a paper or somebody's writing, oh, we got like human performance on, on super glue, then you should know, okay, super glue is a college co collection of different tasks and we'll show a couple of those in the next slides. So it's like a one data set which has multiple sub data sets of different, different kinds, okay? And one of them is RTE, recognizing textual entitlement. So what is it, textual entitlement? We have binary classification and we have a text and the hypothesis and we have to say whether the text entitles the hypothesis, yes or no. Which means if you, if you read the text and the hypothesis, would you say the hypothesis is true? So the text here would be Dana Reeve, the widow of the actor Christopher Reeve, has died of lung cancer at age 44, according to the Christopher Reeve Foundation. This is a text. The hypothesis is Christopher Reeve had an accident. So if you read a text, would you say the hypothesis is true or not? It's not, so it's false, okay? And now we say, oh, text and hypothesis, I've seen it before. I saw it in the you know, natural language inference task. So is it the same thing or not? So Stanford SNLI basically adapted this recognizing textual entitlement. So RT is somehow older and only just a binary classification and SNLI was three ways. So neutral entitlement and contradiction. 
So this is a simil very similar task. And who defined the task? Just the researchers. So you create a data set and say, like, well, this is RTE. And then came people from Stanford and say, oh, this is SNLI. It's a little bit different. So we call it differently, right? But this is, um, this is the standard textual entitlement. Any questions? OK, good. Then, so this is part of superglue. One of these tasks in superglue is recognizing textual entitlement. And what you need for this is, again, understanding the semantic of one document and the other and how they relate to each other. You know? Whether if somebody, if somebody, um, doo -doo -doo -doo, yeah, if somebody who died uh, on cancer from a foundation has something to do with somebody else who had an accident. So you need to kind of understand this connection, right? So the model, if you want to solve this task, you need to understand this, how this works together, some sort of word knowledge, I would say. So another data set in superglue is coreference resolution, um, where you have a sentence with a pronoun and a list of noun phrases from the sentence, and you have to determine the correct referent of the pronoun. So the example makes it clear. The text reads, Mark told Pete many lies about himself, which Pete included in his book. He should have been more truthful. And the question is whether he is Pete or not. So again, Mark told Pete many lies about himself, which Pete included in his book. He should have been more truthful. And I'm wondering, wait a second. Uh, should be true, right? I mean, he is Pete, isn't it? It's Mark. Mark told Pete, truthful. Yeah, truthful. Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is so the hard thing about this course. It's like right after lunch. And if you had goulash with pumice, it puts you basically on random, you know, random uh, performance here on these logical tasks. Okay, so, but we're, you know, thanks for correcting. What you need for solving this is everyday no common sense knowledge, common sense reasoning. So this is a hard task for machines. And as you just saw for humans too sometimes. So this is a preference resolution Vinograd schema challenge, one of part of this, part of super new. Okay, any question? Good. And then we have, um, I'm showing, I guess the third from super glue is boo Q, which is a Boolean question answering. So each example is a short passage and a yes and no question about that passage, passage, yes. So example, the question is, has the UK been hit by a hurricane? Hurricane, and the, the, pass, the, the passage is, the great storm of 1997 was a violent extratropical cyclone, which caused casualties in England, France, and the Channel Island, blah, blah, blah. And you have to say whether, whether it's true or not. So has the UK been hit by a hurricane? after reading this paragraph. And the answer here is yes, because there was like the great storm and casualties in England, so okay. So you need to understand that extra tropical cyclone is a hurricane. And then you have to understand uh, that UK is England and so on. So a lot of kind of common sense understanding and reasoning. So this is a task. Non-factoid information or difficult entitlement like inference to solve. So this is what you need to know or the machine needs to know in order to solve this task. Okay. Any question? Yes. Is it an entitlement or not? Okay, this is a cool, yes. Um, yes and no. If you turn this into, into a, a statement, not a question, the UKP has been hit by a hurricane and this would be like the text, and this would be hypothesis, then it would be uh, entails or not. See, yes. But you're asking a question, so maybe you, when you ask a question, you might give an example here as well. So it's not maybe obligatory, but you know, you kind of, but it, it needs the same thing, yeah. That's a good question, yes. I don't think so. I think it's just binary yes and no. It's uh, zero one. So I guess it's not it's not graded. But I haven't checked. So you can have a look at the paper and see whether they kind of take it into account. I didn't check. Yeah, it's a good point. Okay, anything else? Good. Let's move on. So the last one from uh, Squat. Sorry, last one from uh, Super Glue is the multi RC multi sentence reading comprehension. 
So what does it mean? You have, a, again, a context paragraph, you have a questions or a question about the paragraph, and then you have a list of possible answers, which are true or false. I don't have an example here because it's super long, but you see it's getting more complicated because each possible correct answer, so multiple possible correct, correct answers. So we have a list and each of them could be right or wrong. And then answering each question, they are independent of each other. So you have to evaluate them by one. So you have, I don't know, an example paragraph about the hurricane and then you have like five statements or five questions and you need to you know, have all of them correct. And they kind of can be tricky. And answering question requires drawing facts from multiple context sentences. So there's not only like single sentence in the document, but multiple, and you have to combine them together in order to answer the question. Okay, so it's getting more complicated. You need really like reading comprehension. So you need to comprehend the text. And that's basically what you do also. If you learn like second language and make a test, there's also like reading comprehension, which you need to understand the language and, and blah, blah, blah. So this is multi-RC, kind of challenging task. Any question? Okay, cool. And we're finishing. I don't think this is part of uh, Superglue anymore. So Superglue was like for these tasks different. There's more. So you can have a look. Superglue is like maybe 10 tasks together or maybe more. But these were like the prototypical, prototypical examples. Now we're getting to question answering, which is a squat. So I guess this stands for Stanford Question Answering Dataset because it was done by uh, by people from Stanford. And here's an example. So here's a paragraph. Other legislation followed, including Immigration Bird Conservation Act, the treaty prohibiting the hunting of right and gray whales, blah, 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 something super boring from Wikipedia. And then the question is like, which laws face significant opposition? And you have the reference. You have the paragraph and you ask questions about this paragraph. The point is, this quest, these questions are kind of unanswerable. You cannot answer them from this text, but they have like plausible answers, which are incorrect, because there is this kind of uh, lexical, you know, the same words are used in this paragraph as in the questions. So it kind of tricks the machine to, you know, to make shortcuts and see, yeah, well, the answer should be later loss here. But it's wrong. Or you know, here, what was the name of the of the treaty? And if you just don't pay attention and you just you know keyword spotting, then you say, yeah, 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 it was this Bald Eagle Protection Act, which is wrong. So it's kind of hard task for machines not to jump on these you know quick keyword spotting and just oh this is the answer. So this is really interesting because Squat, the first version, it had had these issues like you know keyword spotting and you can answer even like without reading a lot of a lot of this a lot of this paragraph. Questions? Yes. Uh, who exactly uh, writes the questions? Are this the same people who uh, have to read the text and then uh, put down the answer? Or is that another entity? So I guess, so the question is who writes these questions? Um, it was done by crowd workers. So who, who knows the word crowd worker? So, okay, what is a crowd worker? Uh, somebody who didn't speak at all, who didn't speak at all and knows crowd worker. <laughs> okay, so what is it? Yes, crowd worker. Exactly. So we're small task for people on the internet. So somebody sitting at home and saying, I want to earn $5 per hour because I have to earn money somehow. And then uh, this is uh, labeling cats and dogs and toxic comments and all these tasks or writing questions about paragraphs on Wikipedia. So the best, the biggest platform is MSN Mechanical Turk, where you can, if you're living in the US, I think you need social security number, you can sign up as a worker. If you want something to crowdsource, universities, researchers are just going there. You have thousands of people who are kind of get paid for this tiny job, maybe, you know, and you say, well, the task is here's a, you know, a, a paragraph from Wikipedia, write a meaningful question about it. And the person says, okay, well, uh, which laws face significant oppositions or something like that. I mean, you instruct these people to write it, right? So crowd workers is sort of scalable thing of annotating or creating data sets. This was done by crowd crowdsourcing. Yeah, the whole data set. Okay, any other questions? 
Good. Okay, so we finish uh, text classification, and now, oops. and now let's let's move on to text generation. So, what is text generation? Well, I'll give you examples, and you know what it means. So, uh, machine translation. Machine translation is still hard, even like in. So, I took this picture uh, two months back in Tenerife, and there's a menu which says news of the month, which is wrong already. You know, this is translation of, uh, I guess, from Spanish to English. And the translation to German is even wronger, Nachrichten des Monats on the menu. I don't know, I don't wanna eat Nachrichten des Monats. So yeah, so machine, and, and obviously they did like, they use Google Translate to translate this, but if you don't have the context of the menu, it will just, what's the news of the month? Yeah, it's Nachrichten des Monats, of course. If you don't know if it's on the menu, right? So it's still hard problem. And there are a couple of standard data sets for machine translation. So the task of machine translation, obviously, sentence input, sentence output, mostly. One language, and another language. And there's very many standard data sets from the WNT, which used to be a workshop on machine translation. Now it's called Conference on Machine Translation. But they're using the WNT shortcut for the data set. So WNT14 is, for example, a very famous data set for English-German translation on you know, like general topics. So machine translation, what is, what is so hard about it? What is, what is hard about machine translation? Like conceptually. Uh, some words mean different things in different contexts. Some words mean different things in different contexts, like Nachrichten, of course, yes. Anything else? Anything which is like, uh, sorry, you. Uh, you. Yeah, uh, you have like uh, synonyms and homonyms, so, so words that have multiple meanings or two words that mean the same things and uh... that's true you you have multiple meanings and homonyms synonyms but if you understand the language you can translate to the target language i mean i can speak english but you know and i'm i'm conveying the message of obviously but some some things in my mind are homonyms as well good yeah maybe the sound words don't exist so what you do you have to explain them or say differently okay Anything else? Like, what is the really what's the issue of machine translation if you do if you want to do it properly? That's fine, but you but that's fine, but you can do that. I mean, sure. I mean, you speak. I guess you speak also like multiple languages at least, so you have to learn these difficulties. Yes, but say it. You can say it in German as well. Okay, I'll, I'll let you just some, some time think about it. Yes. Okay. Last last attempt. Sorry. Uh, there is like the problem that uh, even even though some things are grammatically correct in both languages, some some things are just weird to say in the language and and okay to say in some language. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's okay to say something in one language and it sounds weird, but if you do like proper translation with all these things, you can you can translate idioms and they will they will work mostly or jokes. The point is, you have so many different options to translate one thing, and you can't tell which one is better, mostly. So there is one example from this book uh, from Philip Cohen, the translation of, I don't, sorry, I don't speak French. Sans le de... Okay, can, and can, anyone, can, can anyone read this? Who speaks French? Yes. Thank you very much. So here's... Here's so many translations here of that in English. And here's how people, you know, uh, assess that whether it's correct or wrong. And there's no agreement what's a correct or, you know, correct or not correct translation because you can translate the same sentence in so many different ways, right? I mean, if you speak French and English, you can kind of do it for yourself. I can't, but they mean the same thing, but a little different. So there's a little bit of twist of that. And it's just hard to say like what's correct and what's wrong because you can say the same thing in many different ways. And maybe all, are, all of them are correct, maybe not. And people don't agree on that. So people disagree on what's good. I mean, some are clear, clearly bad or correct, but there's disagreement. So it makes it hard. If you wanna do it with machines, right? You wanna show an example and this, this is hard. On top of what you just said before, which is correct. So, as I said, you know, machine translation is hard. We have standard data sets and the ev evaluation of machine translation or evolution of generation is hard, as we will see later. Any question to machine translation? 
Okay, good. So now we have document summarization or abstractive document summarization, which means you take a long document, which for example, here in this CNN Daily Mail standard data set for summarization, you take a document, which is you know, 800, excuse me, 800 tokens long, and you wanna have a summary, which is roughly yeah, 50, 60 tokens on average. So basically extracting the most information, but not extracting verbatim the tokens, but rephrasing what's the gist of this document. And it's hard. Why is it hard? You can, because you don't know what's important in the document. So we have like multiple kind of scenarios because everybody understands something different in the document. And what's, if I show you like a news article and ask you like, you know, can we write a summary? I can guarantee you from 100 people here, I will get like 80 different summaries, 100 different summaries mostly. So it's also like kind of complicated how to avoid. But there's a training data set which have some, you know, human labeled summaries. And there's tricks how to do summarization, how to do evaluation. So it's a thing, it's a task, document summarization, okay? Why is it important? Well, because people are lazy and you wanna, you know, write the article. Well, now we have ChatGPT, so everything is solved. But maybe before you had an article and you would just want to write a summary for the web, like, uh, you know, short snippets, what the article is about automatically. Why not? So clear, any question? Yes. How would you validate it? What, what do you mean? Like, you, so there's there's a there's a there's a metrics for saying this is a good summary or not, and this is what you use. You have some examples, and you compare. You have some some documents and some summaries written by humans, and you let your system create summaries, and then you compare your summary with the gold standard summary, and there's metric to say like, well, this is the same or not. There's metrics to that, which have some flaws. We'll come to that later, okay? Good. And the last thing about generate, you know, there's so many things about generation, but the last one is the person not yet. Uh, so dialogue. So basically you have a dialogue and you wanna do, uh, you know, predict the next utterance. So this is like the chit chat. So you have two persons and they say, hey, hello, how are you today? Oh, I'm good, thank you, how are you? Well, great, thanks, my children. I just about to watch a Game of Thrones. Oh, nice, oh, oh, blah, 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 blah. And the task could be, yeah, just create the next sentence in this in this dialogue, because you maybe you're programming Alexa, you know, Amazon Alexa, and you wanna entertain people about things. And in this data set, they kind of create also personas. So you know that person one is somebody who likes to sky and blah, 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 and persona two is doing something else. So this is one of the data sets you wanna train on just chit chat dialogues, right? Yeah, could be fun. I mean, dialogue research, it's fun. Then came ChatGPT and just, oh, <laughs> it's hard. Okay, so this would be generation. Now, the thing is, we did this, you know, distinction, classification, and generation, but basically you can turn everything into generation. How? Well, you just tell it what to do. So here is an example, translation uh, English to German. The input of your model could be verbatim. Translate English to German. That is good. That's the input of the model. And what you're expecting, this is good. Yeah, this is machine translation, cool. So nothing has changed. Text in, text out. How about here? Uh, nature language inference, so NLI and MNLI means multilingual MNLI. And you would write to the model, MNLI premise, I hate pigeons. And hypothesis, my feeling towards pigeons are filled with animosity. And what you expect the, the model to output is a word called, is a word, entitlement. So it's not saying like zero, one, or two, the label, but it's basically spitting out the label as text, right? It's doing basically the classification by saying, if this were a tweet, you would say, no, if this were a toxic, uh, it was a, uh, the, the hotline called, you would say hotline comment period, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I hate you, T-Mobile, blah, blah, blah. And you would say, uh, and you would finish maybe sentiment. And the model would output text saying negative. This is how you turn basically classification into text generation, but it's the same thing, right? You can, you can do that. There's no basically difference. 
right? Does it make sense? Is it is it really like, oh, well, why should I generate text? Because I can classify. But there's models like GPT, text in, anything out. And you can do classification with them as well. The very same way. You just create a task as you say, oh, uh, premise is that and that, hypothesis is that and that, and spit out the decision. If you do it to G try with chat GPT, you know, try it. Uh, what's the sentiment of this tweet? And you write a tweet, and shit GPT will spit out maybe something longer, but maybe just yeah, negative. This is how it works. Any questions? This is important to understand. Like you can turn everything into text from text to text, even like regression, it just outputs a number. Is there more specific difference? Because in natural language processing, what we were told, this is basically prompting the yeah, prompting. Yes, yeah. It's a, a no, no. It's just a different word for prompting, but prompting is. It means something, zero shot, one shot, blah, 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 prompting. So, yeah, this is prompting. You can turn everything into text in, text out. That's important. OK, great. So we know what we need to solve. How good are we in that? That's another question. OK, so let's move to evaluation a little bit. And since most of people have here some you know, deep learning, machine learning, and so on, so I'm going to just go quickly and don't spend so much time on that. If you have questions, just ask. So we have these data sets, we have these tasks, and we want to do some proper splitting on training and validation and test. So basically, we have training and test data. So training, this is where we train our model. And test data, we never, <laughs> we never train our model on test data. Never. This is, if, if there's one thing you should remember when you leave the university, never train your model on test data. Because you train the model on test data, the model will remember test data, then you show, oh, I have 99% accuracy on test data to make your boss happy. And then you deploy somewhere and it just fail because you can you, you know, you just completely messed up your evaluation. So these have to be like put in the safe and never ever touch before the final thing. Okay? This is really important. So then you play around with training data and validation so you can split it and you know validation for hyperparameters tuning. Okay, so is it is it something that everybody kind of is familiar with? Or somebody, yeah, okay. This is a standard common sense. So train, def, split. Sometimes your data is small, so you do cross-validation, which means you do k-fold. Um, so the k-fold cross-validation, so you split the data into k chunks. And then for each chunks, you do train on some part and test on the other part, right? So you basically do five, here's a five fold cross validation. So some, you know, in first fold, this part is test data, this part is and so on, and so on, so on. So cross validation is a thing standard in machine learning. To be honest, you know, all these data sets we saw before, like IMDB, SNLI, SuperGlue and so on, they have fixed train dev test. They don't do cross validation. For which reason? Because you can really compare performance on the same test data and on the same validation data. You know, if you do cross validation randomly, then you oh there's some randomness. So you don't you know you don't want to do it. If you have small data and you're playing around with new tasks, maybe you want to do cross validation. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. So the standard tasks, they have this train train def test. They don't care about cross validation because in cross validation, yeah, you have to do some random splits, and the randomness will be different from one person to another. So it's better to have fix, right? Okay. Any other question? Okay. So I'm I'm just I put it just for a friend there. Cross validation is a thing. But now let's look into an evaluation of um, of test classification. So classification is easy because we have let's if we have two classes, we can call them we call them positive or negative, so you can map everything into these two classes. And then the thing is, you can, the predictions here, you can put them in, in a thing called confusion matrix, where it, what it means is that it's a table. So here, these will be numbers. Numbers, and then it's basically saying how many times in my test set, something which was actually negative was actually predict, it was predictive as negative. And you make a, plus one here. And then you collect the table for all your test data and get a confusion matrix. So one thing to remember is, is that you know the ordering of columns here is arbitrary. 
you know, it doesn't have to start with negative here and positive here. You can just flip them and flip the rows as well, which will flip the true negatives, false positives, false negatives, and true positives. So it's super messy. So anytime, I mean, you don't have to remember exactly what is true. Well, yeah, maybe it's not a bad thing to remember, but I, I, I don't remember it either because you can flip that and just, yeah, what's left, right? It's true negative. Oh, I don't know. So Wikipedia is your friend. Um, but just, you know, be aware of that. So this is just one example how to do that. So an example here would be, we have a classifier. So here's an, here's an example of, a, of some disease de detection. So some binary task, negative and positive. I do have a disease or I don't have a disease. And these are the counts on the, on the confusion matrix, right? So it means that from, in my test data from 168 plus 33 uh, negative examples were classified as negative 168 and positive as 33. So this is the confusion matrix, how much confused I were, okay? Any question to the confusion matrix? Is it clear to everybody? Is something that you should spend some time kind of you know working around and understanding what confusion matrix is to understand how to make evaluation, but it's, it's also not a rocket science. So any, any questions? Confusion matrix. Okay, good. So you have the confusion matrix for the binary task here because we have two classes. If we have three classes, I'll show you later how it looks. So one, one measure here is the accuracy. So what is it saying? It's only how accurate I was. So the predictions which were correct over all predictions. This is a super fancy formula with sum and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so basically, you take the diagonal of your confusion matrix and divide by the total number of things. So basically, this is an identity function, which means my prediction was something and my gold label was something. And if they're equal, this is plus one. So this is one. And if they're not equal, this is zero. So I'm computing all the matches here and divide by all the numbers of, of instances in my test data, okay? And this is accuracy. So here's the workout example, which I suggest you to compute and just play around with numbers. The accuracy doesn't care about the other numbers here. So these false predictions, whatever happens here, it's not important. You can flip these numbers and the accuracy will be the same. So everybody understands accuracy? Basically, how many times I got it right in the test set? That's as simple as it is. And it's between zero and one. So 100% is, you know, one or 100% is 100% accuracy is the best system. It works perfectly. If you have binary tasks, you know, you can have, you know, and it's balanced data set, 50% would be like the random accuracy. So accuracy has some issues. If you have skewed data set, it won't work that well. So we have another metrics, which are called precision recall and F1 score. Is there anyone who hasn't heard about precision recall F1 score? Okay, good. So it's, um, it's computing. So, so what is precision doing? And now we have an example of precision for a class positive because it will be different for class negative because this kind of ordering is arbitrary. So for class positive, I'm here and I wanna compute a precision for that. So I'm saying, um, Um, whatever I predicted here as positive, so my I predicted something positive. I predicted positive the correct things and predict, predicted as positive something which wasn't positive. So I'm saying how many times did I correctly predict it positive if I said it's positive? So I'm taking the true, true positive over, over this sum, right? So saying like how precise I was. My classifier is set. This is positive. Which part of that was really positive? This is what precision is doing. Recall is saying, yeah, I have my data here. So all of this, uh, all of this in my data set is which is, which is um, positive in my data. So these are actually positive in my data set. How much I found of them, right? So this is the, I take the, the true positive and divide by the sum of all of these positive in my data set. So I have 500 documents which are positive in my data set and I found only 100 of them. 
So my recall is just one is one over five. I didn't find all. And these two are kind of complementary. And you can combine them into one score, which is called the F1 measure F1 score. And it's this har harmonic mean of these two, these two measures. <clears throat> so you know it you might have seen it before, something to know, to, to remember and know how it works. Why is it important? So it's important because it takes into account two different versions of your classifier. You want to maybe precise classifier, you want to maybe more recall oriented classifier, or you want to combine into one measure. Any questions? Great. So the confusion matrix here is for just for two classes, for two classes. But obviously, you might have multi-class problem. And here, this is taken from the Reuters data set, which is the news wire predict, uh, classification into different topics. And here, the confusion matrix is basically the same. So you have the true class, and he, here are the predictions. And if we are compute to create the accuracy, so what's the accuracy of the classifier? Is basically sum of the diagonal. Oh, wow, sorry. Sum of the diagonal over all these sum of all these things would be the accuracy, right? I mean, what's going, what's right, and over all the instances in my test data. How would you turn this into precision and recall? Okay, this is interesting because precision and recall, we define like, you know, true positives, true negatives, but these were just two classes. So how, how do I do it for, for, for a bigger matrix? I have one, two, three, four, five, six classes. So what, what I'm going to do? Yeah, so basically you take class of your interest, which will be interest maybe, and, and merge the rest, you know, and the rest will be merged into one row and one column. And this is how you create basically two by two matrix, okay? This is how you compute it. Um, and then you compute this for each class, and then you can take an average of these F1 scores or do some other other things. So this is kind of you know technical details, but it might get tricky. So always report what you do, right? I recommend this paper. If you're interested in more like how tricky this could be, look, 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 have a look at this paper because all these tiny details make a difference whether you have accuracy of or micro F1 score of 80 or 85 or 90. Make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Okay, so this is the evaluations. Okay, any questions so far? So if you've seen this before, machine learning, it's nothing new, like the same, same stuff over and over. Evaluating this generation. Okay, we're running out of time, but let me just, okay, seven minutes and we're good. It's, it's okay? Good, yeah, we're almost there. Like, yes. So evolution of text generation is hard. Um, why? Because you have different metrics and I'll just, I'll let me just scare you off a little bit. So this is just a part of one large table of different metrics for text generation. So generate, you know, evaluating generation, text generation is, is, a, is a matter of research. And not all these metrics here, so there could be like, I don't know how many, 40 metrics, and they have pros and cons. So it's part, it's basically a research topic. You know, classification is easy, match or not match, cool. Generation, yeah, you can translate it and summarization and oh, it's hard. So there's metrics. I'm gonna show you two of them, which are like super easy, but you don't have to you don't have to remember the formulas because you know if you if you were to implement it, then you better look up the papers. So one of them you should, but you should know the name. It's Blue B L E U Bilingual Evaluation Understudy. It's like the first and most popular metrics for machine translation, and it computes the engram overlap between the reference and the hypothesis. So you have a reference translation. And you have the hypothesis, which is the translation of your machine learning machine translation system. And you're basically comparing how much there is an overlap of n-grams. What is an n-gram? What is a bigram? What is a bigram? Two characters, I would say this would be like character bigram. So just standard n-gram would be two tokens next to each other. It's a bigram. Or trigram would be three tokens next to each other. Okay? So you would compare like pairs of words, the bigrams, and how much there is an overlap. Yeah, it looks easy. Um, there is one score of the corpus, but the drawback, it, it's just a precision based. So you don't 
account for recall. And there's an exact Ingram matching. So there has to be like exact translation. And in translation, you can use some different spelling maybe or different kind of wording of the same thing. So if there is not match, the blue score doesn't work. So there's another metric which is oriented on recall and it's whoosh. If you're wondering why all these machine translation evaluation metrics are French sounding, I have no idea. <laughs> it's maybe the part of the creative. They like, you know, all the transformers like Bert, Roberta, Camembert, you know, all these Elm Street things. Maybe, maybe it was fun. So it's whoosh, so rooch, recall oriented understanding of gisting evaluation. <laughs> it's a terrible name. It's similar to blue. I mean, there's different variants, uh, but counting in the engram matches between the hypothesis and reference. So it's the same, but it's recall based measure. So there's different formula and it's just, it has uh, some other kind of properties, <clears throat> right? And it's measuring the longest common subsequence between the power of sentences. You have a question. Um, does this account for order in the engram? Does that maybe some- The ordering of engrams, whether it counts, well, it doesn't matter where the engram occurs. You know, so you can have the engram in the reference at the beginning and the hypothesis at the end because you can translate a sentence. Uh, yesterday, I was at cinema, or uh, I was at cinema yesterday. And you have yesterday at the beginning and the end. So there's like unigram overlap, which is fine. So it takes this into account, like, or the bigram is more like context, contextualized. Okay, any other question? So remember, blue and rouge are these standard metrics and they have pros and cons. Mostly con, so that's why there's four different metrics which are better. And it's super hard. To, um, I mean, it's, it's easy to hack. Well, it's not easy to hack them, but if you improve blue score, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that human perception of your evaluation of your machine translation is really better. So there is some correlation between the blue scores and how humans perceive the evaluation, but it's not 100%. That's why there is research on that, because you want to you want to have better translation for humans, not just because of blue score. You know, the advantage of the blue score is you can do it automatically. You don't need a human to say, oh, this is better translation than the other. Eventually, in language generation, you want humans to look into the generated text. So, you know, kind of, but it's costly and time consuming and so on. So that's why there are metrics. So there's some caveats of NLP benchmarking. And I listed like, I guess, two or three, and then we're done. So we talked about the gold data parad paradigm. So, and it's easy, like we have like one ground truth and it makes sense when humans highly agree on the answer. So if the annotation task would be, does this image contain a bird or is it, is it learn a verb or what is the capital of Italy? Yeah, people will agree and this is easy. We have gold standard. But if, for example, something which is more, yeah, which is more, Subjective is, for example, is this comment on Facebook toxic or not? Well, people will disagree maybe because it's depending on your subjectivity and or understanding of the language. And we kind of tend to disagree, you know, kind of get rid of these hard cases or non-agreed upon things. But now there's a research, research on that actually these human label variation is an opportunity, not a problem. So this is something which we should maybe take into account and not just pretend, oh, there is one go through. So we should have maybe some variation. This is this is basically a part of current research by the group of Barbara Planck at, uh, in Munich. So remember, if there is a gold standard, well, yeah, somebody has to create a gold standard and they took some arbitrary decisions on the way. So maybe, you know, it was a hard choice. Human annotators are biased because the data sets are constructed by small number of annotators and humans are biased. So if you, you know, you go to Mechanical Turk and at the end of the day, you have maybe hundred workers working for you. All these 600,000 uh, Stanford NLI data, you know, data points was done by, I don't know, 200 workers, which means you get some bias of these people into the data set. So people are biased. And it has some consequences maybe if you let the data create by somebody else, so by annotators that did not contribute to the training set, it kind of influences your performance of the model. So you have some bias in the data which is inherent to the humans. Yeah, take that into mind as well. We might have artifacts in the, sorry, artifacts in the data set, 
So some spurious correlation. So we created a data set, uh, which I'm not going to introduce in the detail, but there was a so logical, logical reasoning in arguments, uh, which is, I don't have time to go into detail, but we have, we, we had a lot of negations there. And some other researchers look at our data set and said like, yeah, if you delete the negation, basically all the performance of your classifier will just drop to random because the, the classifiers are just picking up on these artifacts or spurious correlation in data. And if they see a negation, don't or not, they just kind of predict the, the, the final class, but it doesn't have to do anything with understanding the, the actual task and just picking up on, on artifacts. So it's hard to do create data set there's, which there's no artifacts. And we have to take, you know, think about it like, yeah, solving the task or solving the artifact. So it's important. Okay, any questions? Good. So remember, we have vast amount of tasks and data sets. Data quality matters. Understanding the data annotators and the task matters as well. And we should be familiar with the common evolution tasks and metrics, because then if you read some papers, you know, all human level performance on SNLI, you will know what it means and you will you should know what kind of who created data set for what and what was the kind of bias in the data as well maybe and getting better scores is just a beginning of a story so getting better blue translation yeah nice crunching numbers cool but does it do any better so take this into mind and evaluating text generation is an art having said that thank you very much i'll see you in a week Oh, sorry. Okay, there is two questions. Sorry, no, 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 not yet. Two questions. Uh, the, the practice class is scheduled for right after this. Oh, okay. So the practice class, nothing today and more. So this will be basically hybrid or online. So there will, won't be like practice class in person. Okay. Thank you. That was it. That's it. Thank you. I do have to